Welcome everyone to the Garden Nerd Tip of the Week podcast, where garden nerds from around the world talk shop, share stories, and offer their favorite tip. I'm your host, Christy Wilhelmy. Well, garden nerds, it's change of pace day. It's just you and me, since this is our first podcast of 2023. Uh, took a month off to gather myself, and now we're back with some exciting stuff coming up in the new year. First off, I thought I would share a few upcoming events that you might want to know about that I'm really excited about. First is the Northwest Flower and Garden Festival. That's happening up in Seattle, Washington. The week of February, it's 14th through 19th. I'm going to be there on the February uh, 18th and 19th, a Saturday and Sunday. I'll be teaching two classes, one on composting, where I'll be sharing information on both cold composting, which most people are doing at home, and active batch thermal composting if you want to kick it up a notch to get really, really great quality compost. And I'm also going to be teaching a class on spring garden planning strategies. So to find out more about that, that's at gardenshow.com. You can go there for tickets and all the information and scheduling and whatnot. Uh, the other exciting thing that's happening is that the Heirloom Expo is coming back this year. It was off for 2020, 2021, and 2022 because of the pandemic, but now they're back. And they're not in Santa Rosa this year, in Santa Rosa, California. They're going to be in Ventura County, California, in Southern California at the Ventura County uh, Fairgrounds. And I'm really excited because that's a lot closer to me. I will be teaching a class there, uh, but I'm not sure what yet, so stay tuned for information about that. But really, if you've never gone, it is like running away to the circus for gardeners. You have to go. You can go to gardennerd.com and look for any, you know, just type in Heirloom Expo and you'll see a bunch of pictures that I've ever posted about it. It's really wonderful and you should make a plan to go. Also, just a quick tidbit, I am working on the next volume of my novel Garden Variety. I took... December and January to work on that book to get out a first draft and now I'm working on you know tweaking it and getting it in the right order and building it out fleshing it out so that it's a full-fledged novel that I can send to my agent so working on that uh, so that explains why I wasn't around in January and why I may need to take a break here and there along the way so Let's talk about warm winter gardening, what's coming up for us. And even if you're not in a warm winter zone, if you have snow on the ground, this will happen later. So hang tight for this after spring frost. But for warm winter gardens, here's what's going on right now. Here at Garden Nerd headquarters, we have had so much rain that we've got what, what is looking like it's going to be a super bloom here in our, on my own backyard. We've got nasturtiums growing everywhere, poppies popping up, lots of volunteer flowers, milkweed, uh, borage, uh, lots of volunteer cilantro and parsley and stinging nettles up the wazoo. Let me tell you, I'm going to be posting a blog post on how to cook stinging nettles a myriad ways because that's what I've been doing over the last month. <laughs> stinging nettle pie, stinging nettle eggs, stinging nettle soups, stinging nettle stew. What else have I made? Gosh, I feel like I've done every pasta. Yeah, pasta with stinging nettles, risotto with stinging nettles, everything, everything I can think of. And I'll just say this, if you do want to pick stinging nettles, you need to make sure you're wearing dish gloves, rubber dish gloves. Don't be a hero. They do sting. They, they really hurt for a while and then it fades. And the other word to the wise is do de-stem the nettles. Take just the leaves, uh, toss the stems. Unless you're doing a pureed soup, it's just going to be super twiggy. And I've tried it a bunch of different ways. I've tried destemming uh, and using just the leaves. I've tried putting everything in there and then trying to pull the, the stems out later. Well, the leaves kind of stick to the stems, so that's not great. And I've also tried chopping it up really fine, but it still comes out very twiggy. So destemming, it is worth the effort. Uh, that's what I'm going to be doing from now on. So more on that in the future. Also, we're harvesting stuff out of the garden. We're harvesting lettuces, green onions, mustard greens, arugula, cilantro, parsley, uh, peas. The first of the peas have started to arrive. I've harvested some broccoli, lots of kale, and I'm trying to think of, oh, you know, some tangerines off of the tangerine tree and lemons are all coming in right now too. So those are what's going, that's what's going on here at Garden Nerd Headquarters. 
One of the things we are about to do, if you haven't done it already, is prune your fruit trees. It's the perfect time to prune citrus, pomegranates, apples, and pears. If you do have stone fruits, I would be careful about pruning those, particularly apricots. Apricots I recommend only pruning in summer, but peaches, nectarines, and plums, if you do not have rain in the forecast for at least 10 to 14 days, you can do some pruning because that'll give it time for those cuts to cure up before they get wet. Apricots suffer terribly from exposure and wetness and they end up getting diseases and dying. So I don't recommend pruning those in the winter, but those other citrus, uh, pomegranates, apples, and pears that I mentioned, you can do those right now. And roses, if you haven't done your January rose pruning, like I haven't, uh, you can still do it now in February. They might start budding out, but basically you wanna get everything before it starts budding out or right as it starts budding out. Make those pruning cuts, removal and reduction cuts to thin, clean out crossing branches, trim back the size and all of that. And then they'll jump to life in a few weeks. Also, it's time to start seeds for tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants. If you're planning on putting your tomatoes, peppers, and eggplants in the ground in late March, early April, now's right about that time, six to eight weeks prior to last frost, or in our case, when we're gonna plant out because we don't get a frost. This is one of what my team member calls a shoulder season where we are right now, where we're, it's kind of too late to put in certain things, but not late enough to put in others. So it's too early for the warm and hot season stuff, but it's on the cusp of being the right time to plant the cool season stuff. So I recommend sticking with lettuces and other greens like, you know, arugula, mustard greens, cilantro and parsley, those things that bolt to seed really quickly. Uh, radishes and other root veggies, carrots, parsnips, beets, radishes, turnips, and potatoes and peas. Those will get a good start before it gets warm. But if you live in a place where, I kind of joke, we, <laughs> I say we have spring for like two weeks and then it's summer, you know, once March hits. So if you live in a place where that's the case, where you're suddenly getting temperatures upwards of 80 degrees, then hold off on planting anything that forms a fruit or a head, just stick with the greens until then. But if you live in a cold place, you can start seeds indoors for those cool season crops and plant those out when your last frost hits, which across the country, the average is April 15th, but I know that varies depending on where your hardiness zone is. All right, also, if you didn't prune your asparagus and or cane berries over winter, uh, now's the time to do it. I have a video on how to prune cane berries, blackberries in particular, on the Garden Nerd YouTube channel that you can watch and uh, take some hint on how to do that. Asparagus, you know, there's two schools of thought about asparagus. Some people will leave the foliage on the plant over winter, which I do because the ladybugs love to come and breed and use that as habitat. So I absolutely leave it for them. Uh, others will cut it down. So if you were one in the first camp where you left it over winter, now's the time to cut it down because soon that will be starting to produce and you will want asparagus from your asparagus plants because they're a commitment, right? It takes three years to establish, but once they're going, 20 year crop, yay. And also, since we've had a lot of rain, it's definitely time to weed. Uh, one thing though, if you do pull weeds, put down mulch right afterwards to keep the soil covered, to protect the soil microbial life inside there and not uh, trigger more weed growth because nature abhors bare soil. So keep it covered with mulch once you weed. Also, uh, before I plant any seeds in seed trays, I like to plan my spring garden out on paper. Why? Because then I know exactly how many plants I'm gonna need and I don't end up wasting seeds by sowing too many plants. And then I have that, that gardener's moral dilemma about what to do with those extra plants. <laughs> you know I'm talking to you. I mean, it's a tough one because we don't wanna throw any plants away. We don't wanna thin them out. We wanna just you put them all to good use. But if you don't have a friend or a community garden or a school you can drop them off at, then make sure you plan your garden on paper first and then just plant as many seeds as you need. That said, while your seeds are out, it's a good idea to check your seed supply and order replacements. All those seed catalogs that came piling into the mailbox over winter are by now, for me, dog-eared and circled, and I know what seeds I'd like to buy, but I don't know, I haven't checked my seed collection yet, so it's a good time to open each packet, look inside and see, are there more than two zucchini seeds in this packet, and should I get more? 
So that's a good idea to do. Speaking of seeds, here are some things that I am hoping to try and plant this year, or at least I'm very, very interested in planting this year. The first is called Manpu Kuji Carrots. It's hard, it's kind of a mouthful. Uh, it is something from Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company. It's offering, they're offering it for the first time this year. And these are carrots, they're orange, they have green tops, just like regular carrots, but they grow to a length between two and four feet long. Now, I don't know anyone who has a refrigerator that can hold a four foot carrot. That's not really why I'm thinking about these carrots. The reason why I'm thinking about these carrots is because they would be fantastic for breaking up compacted soil. You may have heard me talk about this permaculture technique where you plant daikon radishes in a place you plan on growing maybe in a, you know, six months or a year. Let those roots dig and burrow deep down into the soil and break up compacted soil for you. And if you can pull them out when you do, there are little holes you can fill in with compost or leave them there, let them bolt to seed. And then as they rot and decompose, they're going to break up soil even more. You're going to breed bacteria down in there and they're going to break up the soil, the fungi are going to come in and start working on those carrots. Anyway, it's a great thing. So if you can't grow them for the length, <laughs> grow them for the benefits of breaking up compacted soils. So that's one reason, one thing I want to try. The second thing I'm excited to try this year is a partner to something I grew last year. We have been plagued with basil downy mildew for a few years now, and it's gotten to the point where I've decided I just need to grow basil downy mildew resistant varieties. And what that looks like to me is these two open pollinated varieties from Rutgers. It's Rutgers Devotion and Rutgers Obsession. Uh, they also came out with a couple of hybrid varieties, but I'm sticking with the open pollinated varieties so that I may be able to save seeds from them someday. Those are both on offer from High Mowing Seed Company. And I'm, I can't tell you how, how many, well, I made 10, 12 jars of pesto each batch of pesto requires six cups of basil leaves. I mean, I just, it kept producing. All my other basils die, and I grow eight different varieties in two different places. They all died with a basil downy mildew. The Rutgers devotion went crazy. And from two plants, I had enough basil <laughs> to make that much pesto all summer long, and I'm using it now in the winter. So basil downy mildew resistant varieties from Rutgers. Very excited about that. Also, I got seeds for holy basil. I've never grown it before. I'm really excited to try it. It is a different type of basil that was probably hopefully not susceptible to basil downy mildew. We'll see. Since one of my characters in Garden Variety has a uh, a connection to Tulsi, I figured I would try growing it. And I got those seeds, I believe, from John Sheeper's Kitchen Garden Seeds. So if you're interested in checking out a different kind of basil, it's used medicinally and ceremonially, but it's also very pretty. So I'm going to grow that. And another seed that came in from Renee's Garden Seeds was uh, with their media kit that I get every year is a climbing zucchini. It's a regular looking zucchini but it has more of a winter squash growth habit, meaning it will actually be vining in a way that I know I can trellis it up a trellis. Most zucchini varieties are bush habit growing and the, they sure they stretch out over time, but they mostly are not great for growing up a trellis. But this variety is specifically bred for that. It's an open pollinated variety, so I'm giving it a try. And I'm excited to see how it works. I will report back my findings. Also, I haven't grown this in a while, but I'm giving it a try again. I love pumpkins. I love winter squashes. I, my whole garden would be winter squash if I had enough room, <laughs> but I don't. I'm going to grow the Connecticut field pumpkin. I know it sounds really boring. It's just a boring old pumpkin, but it's something that I grew one year and it did really, really well. And so I'm going to just grow it again, see what happens. And the last thing I'm planning on trying, which I've grown once before and failed miserably, I think my soil was just too dry, is jicama. Jicama is sort of like a sweet potato or a potato in that the foliage grows above ground, the fruit itself is below ground, the tuber itself is below ground. 
And jicama is something that is used to growing in some moist environments, which I don't have at all. But this year, instead of trying to trellis the vines up in a vertical gardening situation, I'm going to let the foliage cover the plot and see if that helps retain moisture a little bit better as a living mulch. So those are my seeds that I hope that maybe you'll try. You'll find notes for all of these in the blog post that goes along with this podcast. Now it is tip time. And the tip that I have is I wanna make a plea for gardeners everywhere to spring for a laboratory soil test. It's far better than the home kits that test for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. And some of them test for pH. Lab tests like the ones I send my clients work to at Wallace Laboratories, they're in El Segundo here in Los Angeles, but they're everywhere and even universities offer lab tests. But some of them will include a heavy metals test along with it. Other labs, you have to pay extra for it, but Wallace Laboratories actually uh, includes heavy metals in with their regular soil testing. Now, why heavy metals? I feel like it's really important to know about certain heavy metals because if you live in an urban environment or even a suburban environment or you're by a highway or a freeway or live under the flight path of an airport, heavy metals end up in your soil. Zinc, lead, arsenic, copper. These are the ones that show up the most. And some of them like zinc and copper will actually inhibit the growth of plants. They bind up nutrients in the soil. You can have excessive amounts of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in your soil and zinc will bind it up and your plants will sit there and be stunted and stagnant and you keep throwing fertilizer on it and you can't figure out what's going on. It's usually zinc, excessive zinc in the soil. And copper is something I look for as well because if you're using any uh, copper spray, you know, dormant spray that includes copper in it or fungicide that includes copper in it, for powdery mildew or any other fungal infestations. Here's the thing you need to know. Copper persists in soils. It doesn't dissipate. So when you're spraying it, you need to be very sparing. Make sure it lands on what you want it to and not on the soil below and it doesn't drip all over the soil because it stays there and it binds up nutrients. So it's really important for me to get soil tests that tell me what's really going on in the soil. It's like driving with your eyes open and it makes it me able to help my clients uh, fix their soil problems. Because those NPK tests and even the soil pH tests, they don't tell you that kind of stuff. Because you can have an overabundance of the big three, the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and still nothing will grow. So that's my tip. Get a soil test from a laboratory, treat yourself to it. You will not regret it. Most soil tests are easy to gather. You take, you know, five or six to 10 samples from about six inches deep. You combine it all in one place. You send about two cups of it into the lab. They will send you the results usually within a week or so. And then you know what to do moving forward. So that's my tip, Garden Nerds. You'll find a link to everything I talked about during this podcast on GardenNerd.com. That's it for this week. Subscribe to this podcast on Apple Podcast or wherever you stream. Visit us for tons of free gardening information at GardenNerd.com. Show your support for this podcast and the other free stuff on Garden Nerd by becoming a Patreon subscriber. You'll find us on Instagram and Twitter under GardenNerd1, on Facebook as GardenNerd.com, and of course, our Garden Nerd YouTube channel. Happy gardening!